Today we have Trevor Stephenson with us. He is based in Madison and the artistic director and founder of the Madison Bach Musicians. Today he'll take us on a guided tour of three Baroque, Baroque, I haven't drank enough coffee yet. Uh, three Baroque geniuses all born in 1685. Um, he does have some CDs up here, so afterwards, if you want to come check out some of he's been recording for how many years? 20. 20 years. So he's got a lot of information up here, um, definitely worth checking out afterwards. Um, but please give a warm welcome to Trevor Stephenson. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Good morning. How are you guys? Good, great, good. This is awfully early to be giving a concert. Right. <laughs> Goodness, right. The singers don't even spit till noon, you know, so that, that's the old saying. So anyway, but I'm playing the keyboard. So good, I, I, this harpsichord uh, was in Madison, Madison in my living room uh, yesterday until 4.30. I drove up here last night, we loaded it. I got some sleep, we come back, tune it this morning, and here we are. So, you know, and I just can't believe it. It just scares me to death scheduling anything in January this far north of the Mason-Dixon line, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, we are so lucky. I just, it, it, wonderful. So again, I'm Trevor Stevenson. I direct the Madison Bach Musicians uh, and, and been in Madison since about 1990. And uh, so that's, that's the end of me, right? Uh, what I want to talk a little bit about these three incredible composers who were all born in 1685, uh, it, it, which is, it's because they're not just three good or pretty good composers. They're three of maybe the top six or seven of all time, Bach, Handel and Scarlatti. Uh, and what's particularly interesting beyond the fact that they're born all in the same year is that they, they're very different in their sensibility about how, you know, what they want to tell you about life, how, what the message is. They lead very different careers. They come from different families uh, and, and some are famous in their day and some are almost unknown in their day, even among these three musicians. So I thought we would just have fun by doing the class of 1685. They were all virtuoso harpsichordists. Uh, they also played the organ and all sorts of keyboard instruments, and most of them played the violin and things like that as well. But the keyboard was their, their main instrument. And so I brought a, a, a harpsichord, the style of which they would have known as young men. This is a, about a 1660 style Flemish instrument, and it was made in Madison oh, 20 or so years ago by my colleague Norman Shepard. Um, but there's a very famous painting by Vermeer in which you can see this harpsichord in action, though you cannot hear it in the painting. Uh, right, right. Anyway, it's called The Concert. Uh, and in the, in the painting, there is a young woman seated at the harpsichord. There's another young woman standing at the tail of the instrument, uh, holding her hand up, keeping time, which in the old Dutch paintings, they, they were full of symbols. That was a symbol of moderation and discipline to, to be keeping time. And then there's a very fat man, a large man, <laughs> sitting with his back to you. He's so large, he's covering the lute that he's playing. You know, uh, right, and probably not a symbol of moderation. Um, so <laughs> anyway, so there are the three of them. And that, and that painting was in the Boston Gardner Museum until about 1990, and then it disappeared one night uh, and has never been seen since. Right. You know that story? They, they were just upgrading the security system, and just before the upgrade kicked in, it disappeared. What a coincidence. Yeah. Right, and the old, I don't have it, right, so anyway, but it, it is this instrument, it weighs about 95 pounds, it doesn't even break 100 pounds, it goes in and out of my van all year, I ship it to California every summer for concerts, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what happens in it, and about these great men who wrote for it. Just a couple of things about what goes on in a harpsichord. <clears throat> When I push down a key, it's a teeter-totter. Uh, I push down my end of the teeter-totter. There's a fulcrum in the middle. The back end goes up. And there's a wooden stick called a jack that go passes by a very thin guitar-like string. And poking through the jack horizontally is a tiny sliver cut from the shaft of a crow feather. And that sliver plucks the string on the way up. 
On the way down, when it runs into the string, it's designed, it's in a little pivoting mechanism within the jack that allows it to pivot out of the way, fall underneath the string, and reload. I know. For, it's 14th century technology. <laughs> we always say it's kind of pre-catapult or so, I don't know. But, <laughs> but it can reload so fast that you cannot, you cannot keep up with it. So. So much is that I know I, I had to play that otherwise I'm never going to wake up. So that's that's ha that's Handel's little wake up formula. Um, so anyway, you can hear even in all the trills and doodads that they, that those those keys are quit and the quills are reloading. You know as fast as you can go. Isn't that amazing? You know I have no idea how they ever, ever they ever thought of it. One of the things about this harpsichord, I'll take questions a little later if you don't mind. One of the things about this harpsichord is that it actually is plucked, the strings are plucked with crow feathers, and it gives a very sweet sound. A lot of harpsichords, 1960 and on, opted for plastic quills, which give a very brilliant sound, but it never sounds this musical. Uh, it just, and so uh, it really does matter what you pluck the string with. It's just like the bow on the violin. It really matters how it's built. Um, and so, anyway, hooray for crows. You know, and it, <laughs> it, it took, you know, it took millions of years to get this right. You know, and the crows that weren't right were eaten by the jaguars, you know. That because, I mean, they were because they didn't get off the ground fast enough. So it's just, I mean, you know, if, if you believe in that. So anyway, I'm just saying, so I'm just saying that it's, uh, you know, it's interesting how that works. Now, the piece I just played is by George Frederick Handel. We don't know when he wrote it. He published it sometime in mid-career. I want to say a few things about, about this amazing man. He's born, in, again, in 1685 in central Germany, just about 80 miles from where Johann Sebastian Bach is born, and only a month or so apart, which is really weird. But their family lives were so different. Handel's father was almost 60 years old when Handel was born. It was a second marriage. Uh, I, little George Frederick was probably just a blip on the radar screen in their very busy family life, which had nothing to do with music. Music was just not really in the mix. But little George Frederick Handel was an amazing musician, and they got him some keyboard instruments and violins and things like that, and he was just an ace at them. He could just do anything on them. Well, much to the father's chagrin, this was, the father hated music, I mean, pretty much, and certainly didn't think that a young man should be investing his career in music, you know, as, as we all know, that's where the big bucks are. And, you know, I went into music for the money. So, so anyway, but so Handel's father took all the instruments out of the house. He actually, you know, it was kind of like a video game coup. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull all these instruments out of the house, right, and you, you quit wasting your time. Sometime not too long after that, and we have the story on Handel's authority. He dictated it to a, a biographer late in life. Sometime after this, the, all the instruments being pulled out of the house, Handel's father wanted to go to a nearby court for kind of like a, a day at the spa. And the courts were, they were lovely situations. And, and the father had an elder son who was in his 30s who was a butler at this court. So it's kind of like going to the casino or the spa or something for the day. So he went off to court and George Frederick, who was about eight or so years old, begged his father, please take me to court. You know, not only is the food wonderful, but the music's wonderful. They have services all day long. And, and, and the father said, absolutely not. Right. Uh, and he left 
George Frederick at home, got in a carriage, left town. At the edge of town, who comes running across the field to intercept the carriage? George Frederick Handel, eight years old. This is right out of a, like a Forrest Gump moment, you know? Right? <laughs> running across the field, he stops the carriage, he begs his father yet again, please take me to court. The father says, get in. Okay, so they go to court. There's all sorts of musical things going on. And at some point in the day, little Handel, after a service, sneaks up to the organ loft and starts playing on this beautiful organ at the court. And the duke of the court, the head honcho, is still there in the room. And he hears this, and he just, his head whips around, and he goes, well, who is this genius? I mean, he's playing, well, you know, well, it's, the, it's this eight-year-old kid who's, you know, is the, there's a servant here and his father, blah, blah, blah. And the duke says, Let me, I want to talk to the father, right? Or the father, and you can see it coming, right? right? He says, and he says to the father, this boy is obviously a genius. You are taking care of his education, right? His musical education. Well, as a matter of fact, we just burned all the instruments, you know. So, so anyway, it was kind of a Downton Abbey moment, you know. And anyway, uh, and Handel said his father reneged and, and, and let Handel have music lessons and, and build his career in music. Handel's a very self-made man. He goes off to Italy at about the age of 19 and learns everything about great violin playing and great singing, and then takes that knowledge, marries it to his sense of German counterpoint, and moves up to England, makes up quite a bit of money publishing in England and, and writing operas. The English love Italian operas. This is 1810, 1820, or excuse me, 1710, 1720 or so. And Handel, he plays for royalty. He, he is a well-published man. He is a, a revered figure uh, and is famous in his day, like Mark Twain is a genius who was acknowledged as a genius in his own day. So anyway, uh, just a few things about this Handel piece, and I'll do another one, uh, just to give us a little more scope on him. Watch, watch how he, I'm going to do like a little bit of a frame-by-frame frame analysis, it's brief, albeit, of this piece. The first thing you hear in it is unbridled joy, okay? Rock and roll. I mean, there's just, there's, there's, no, there's no care in the world that could pull you down from that mood. Then the next thing he does is he reaches for a high note, and went, which should be an ecstatic moment. But when he reaches for the high note, the harmony goes dark, right? It's a very unexpected move. And he does it so well, you can hardly catch him doing it. But it gives a ballast to the story. It gives a, a back to it. So like that. It's like, oh, well, there are more serious things to think about, aren't there? You know, so. so then he's so clever, he kind of erases it. <laughs> that's like a, that's like, well, we'll start over. Okay, all right. So you have unbridled joy, concerns, and depth, and then, well, we'll start over. And again, but this time he stays high. So he can launch up into the trumpet register. the most earnest of all registers. Play the second half again. There's the trumpet. Now watch what he does here. He takes the erasure motif and doubles it. So that you get to a nadir, right? You can feel it's like 3 a.m. when the most serious sleep is being done. And he's, this is all on one page, right? And then there's rebirth. And notice how the rebirth is asymmetrical. <laughs> it's wah 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 like that. I mean, if I had written it, I would have would I would have. like that, you know, I'd gotten an A on my paper, you know, and it's like very nicely composed, right? It's like, but Handel's a genius, and he knows to put in that lurching kind of organic, you, you can almost feel the human body is, is being invoked like that, of you've got to work, you've got to earn it to get back to the top. And this piece is one page long, it has a beginning, 
a middle, and an end. And when you get to the end, which is exactly like the beginning, you're a better person than when it started. You know? <laughs> and, and it's every time. You know, it's a, you, can, you can play this 100 times in a row. You'll never wear it out. So anyway, I, I think that's why Handel was famous. He had an amazing ability to address the public, whether it be Messiah in two hours or whether it be a one-page piece. He just had a, an orator's gift in, in his music and was famous in his own day. Let's do another little piece, a strange little thing called impertinence. jolly little thing, just a one-pager again, a sonatina in B-flat, approaching the Wizard of Oz in its entertainment value. <laughs> it really is. Listen to this. <laughs> John, I know. And Handel learned, he must have learned from the Italians that the tune sells it. The tune has to be so good that in the middle of the night when you're looking in the refrigerator for a snack, there's that tune. It's like, oh my gosh, it's there. And all of these tunes by Handel, once they get in your head, they never go away, right? So we call it, in music, we call those earworms, right? Everyone know? Right, it's a, it's a horrible image, but, uh, but, but a fitting thing. He might, and the Italians knew that the tune has to sell it. It has to be so well constructed that it just it will, it will not leave you. Um, and you can see him playing it out over and over again. So uh, I, I hope it's obvious why he was famous. Um, he was, Handel was one of the greatest composers. And I mean, he was huge. He was the Orson Welles of music, right? He, I don't know what he weighed at some point, but probably pushing 300 pounds. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I, I mean, if he was diabetic or if he just ate to stay awake all night. Remember, and, no, well, these people, these people wrote thousands and thousands of pages of music all by hand, right? They had some copyists, but most of the work was don donkey work done by your own hand. And they didn't have copy machines, right? So, so if you wanted somebody else to have the, the piece, you copied it out. It was just what... I'm just trying to emphasize how hard the work was, right? And in Bach, his entire family, they were copyists, 
right? Uh, all the kids, his wife, everybody was at the table all the time. If you were going to make an accurate movie about how these, how these composers live, 90, 95% of the movie should be somebody sitting at a desk in the middle of the night writing. That's, that's what they did, you know? Um, and if you think about it, when you have to write things out, Imagine if tonight, instead of watching TV or, you know, something, Colbert or something, you copied out Ham, well, which is great, but copied out Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 1, you know, lower the Act 1, whatever. You would be very tired tomorrow, but you would know, it, it, you'd have your hands on it. And I think they understood that it's by getting your hands in it like that, that it changes, it changes you. So anyway, we'll come back to Handel at the end. I want to, I want to go south. Handel at around the age of 20 goes down to Italy. Uh, and one night, uh, there, he meets up with another harpsichordist, another keyboard player who is as good or better than he, named uh, Domenico Scarlatti. Scarlatti is an Italian by birth uh, his fa and has a very different home situation from Handel. Scarlatti's father was one of the most famous opera composers in Europe. And uh, who, his name was Alessandro Scarlatti, very well published. So, so Domenico Scarlatti growing up and deciding to go into music is a bit like Steven Spielberg's kid deciding to go into film. You know, it's like, Dad, I think I'll go into film. You know, I said, like, oh, good idea, you know? We have plenty of uh, materials around here. So, so exactly the opposite of Handel in that he, Scarlatti had every advantage. We know that he was a, a, a harpsichordist of, of, of such skill that sometimes he would, you know, kind of wait for other harpsichordists to play. Then he would go up and play a, a, a few pieces, and the, sometimes those harps, the other harpsichordists would never play again. You know, it was... There was a pianist named Art Tatum back in the 1940s and 50s who probably, I think for my money, played like Scarlatti. Uh, it was just unbelievable facility and effortlessness and grace like that. Um, and probably Chopin played the piano, something like that. Um, so anyway, a mysterious fellow. Scarlatti in his mid-20s through uh, various, uh, what do you call it, you know, kind of uh, political contacts with the Portuguese court, he is suddenly offered a job to be the private tutor to the princess in Portugal, right? So, which is a long way from Italy, right? So he moves to Portugal and, and, and never goes back to Italy for any kind of career. And his, his job is to make music every night after dinner for the king and the queen and to teach their daughter uh, 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 Maria Barbara, the harpsichord, and be her tutor. And, they, and their relationship lasts almost 40 years. But that is, when she grows up and marries into the Spanish royalty, there's a huge political connection to Spain. They're going to try to uh, put to rest some of their uh, our differences. She takes Scarlatti with her. Okay? Uh, as like your private trainer, personal trainer, you know, or your best cook, your best musician. So... We'll just l sample his style here and then talk about him. Scarlatti probably spent a lot of time with uh, guitar players, hanging out with Spanish guitar players. I always imagined he was buying their drinks, too. You know? And, you know, and could you play me that riff one more time? So this is a sonata he wrote, and he wrote 550 of these.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dramatica. Thank you. Thank you. I know. You see what I mean by the Art Tatum thing? I mean, it's just like, and that's probably only half of what he really did. I imagine he was, it was even more florid than that, you know, and he would just sit down and do this. So how do we have this music? Because Scarlatti didn't publish. He, there were 30 sonatas of his 550 that were published in his lifetime. Um, and one set, and it did quite well in English markets and other places. And the rest of it really is just a miracle that we have it at all. So here's how it went. Um, remember, they're, Scarlatti, they're up in this castle. They're not public musicians. They're private entertainers, night after night. There are no programs for what they did, really. Um, it's just evening music. You know, The best musicians in, in Europe were there, but we don't have much of a record. And what records there were were probably destroyed in the Lisbon fire uh, of 1755 when the great earthquake came and, and some other wonderful fires that came along the way. So anyway, so Scarlatti... Here he is writing these sonatas, and we don't even know if he wrote them down. We have not one sonata by Scarlatti in his hand. We have other pieces in his hand. We have not one in his hand. What happened was that the court copyists, who were professional copyists, they had beautiful hand, musical handwriting, they made presentation copies for the queen, 20 or 30 sonatas at a whack, and get in these beautiful hand-tooled leather volumes and they gave them to her you know uh, probably on birthdays or whatever because she was Scarlatti's main patron she was his his wonderful student and and she took him everywhere and and so she had this collection of his sonatas so probably more than 500 of these were in her possession perhaps in a single copy or two uh, I know it's crazy and uh, even straight to even a, th a thinner thread than by which Shakespeare's works hang um, and she, uh, Scarlatti dies first, and then she dies a few years later, and all of her music goes to the court singer, whose name was Farinelli. You may, if you've ever, he was the last great castrato male soprano of the castrato period. Okay, that's a male, a male soprano uh, created by operation, right? Okay, <laughs> got it. Okay. <laughs> the scary thing is, it worked. You know, it's like, it's like. So anyway, he was, he was the court singer there. So when he's in his last few years, he leaves Spain and moves back to Italy with all Scarlatti's sonatas in his trunk. I know. It's like, it'd be a great movie with this trunk bouncing along this carriage. It's like, in there are 550, you know, of these monsters. This is just what I know. And they're incredible music. Um, so anyway, uh, and, he, and they end up in libraries and other private uh, uh, collections in Italy, and that's how we, and fortunately, people held on to them close enough that we have them. And in the early 19th and, and later 19th century, there was a first edition of Scarlatti, and then a man named Ralph Kirkpatrick, an American harpsichordist, uh, devoted his life to, to saving Scarlatti's music, cataloging it, um, and getting it all published, and, and now there are Scarlatti editions and all that. So anyway, and he wrote all sorts of music, but mo his best stuff are these two and four page sonatas for keyboard, right? And uh, anyway, so I hope you just, I think it's a fascinating story. We don't, it's amazing how little we know about him because he was holed up in this court situation. It's supposed to Handel, who's a public figure in England, we know loads about Handel, like that, and Handel publishes. So there's, there's Domenico Scarlatti. Um, how am I doing on time? I know we only have an hour and I wanna, what is that? I can't read that. 30 minutes left. 30 minutes left. <laughs> the hand signal. The lights up here are rather bright. Um, <laughs> So a couple of things about how the harpsichord is expressive. I mean, that you know, people say, well, you know, it doesn't have dynamics, and really dynamics doesn't enter into this, this music. What, what the composers were relying on is what the, what the harpsichord has in spades, which is a sense of high and low and everything in between. It's the psychoacoustics of thin wire that the higher a note you play with a thin wire, the higher it seems. So. That's the soprano. If I go down to the alto, one octave lower, it's a long, notice a huge change, right? 
So I mean, we always say these gals are neighbors, but their voting records are quite different. So, um, you know, I mean, it's cheap, I know, but, but anyway, but, but you, can, you can see, whereas on the, pian on the piano, you'd have to go four or five octaves before the color of the sound changed that much. The piano is designed to be homogenous and integrated, and that's created by the very thick wire that's in the piano. That, that makes, it averages everything out. But thin wire, And when you cross middle C, there are no gals anymore. It's you know who. Listen, listen to how male. Isn't that weird? And down an octave below that. So when Scarlatti starts, even an octave is kind of a life event, you know. So um, anyway, does that make sense? Right, and that's how, that's where the expression comes from. I have to take one of these out here. You know, what the weather, weather is like this, what, sometimes, so that's the jack. I'll do, try to do a little road repair here. But anyway, that's, that's the jack, that's the stick that rides on the end of the key. The crow feather, it's not the red you're seeing. The red is the damper that stops the sound when you let go of the key. The crow feather is, you'll have to come up and see it afterward. It's just a couple millimeters long. I know, it's just that tiny black sliver. I know, and it makes enough sound, it fills this room. Isn't that incredible? You can look, you, compared to a piano hammer, a piano hammer is like the size of a baby's fist, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a big thing, you know. Um, the reason you can get away with that, with such a small energy device, is that plucking the wire is a much more efficient way of getting sound out of it than hitting it with a hammer. You know, I mean, you have to, if in the Piaget model of, of, of infants, if you stretch a string in front of 900, 1,000 young infants, you know, 999 out of 1,000 will eventually reach up and pluck it, right? And then one will go get a hammer, you know? And, you know, so, you know, I mean, it's just a weird way to get sound out of a string by hitting it, right? Yeah, it's like, so, so the piano, but the piano br brings dynamics into it and other good things. But that's why we can get away with such a small thing. And it's also why this can weigh 95 pounds. Um, if, it, if it had piano wires in it, it would need to weigh 700 pounds to have the strength to withstand the incredible tension of a piano string. So anyway, I'm going to see if I can get this note to work again, or we're not going to play any music in that key. <laughs> you know, what, and you travel in the winter, the humidity's just changing all the time. We'll hope. So, and this is a little thing that keeps the jacks from jumping out, you know, like salmon, keeps them from spawning, you know. <laughs> if you ever looked at it, they look like, they're, they're trying to get up over the dam, you know. Here's a little, let's just, what, I want to do the, the, the side of Scarlatti that people know a little better, which is, uh, is super happy mode. Uh, I started with that, that dark kind of a nocturnal piece. Uh, and then this is one that uh, I'm still pretty much convinced that Paul Simon, when he wrote Feeling Groovy, knew this piece. You, you see what you think?
very gently. <laughs> Isn't that cute? I know, that's right. And this music, you, you can hear the, uh, the harpsichord, I mean, think about the shape of the sound in it. You, when you pluck a string, you get a lot of energy right at the beginning of the sound, and then it attenuates quite quickly. Whereas the piano, it actually, it starts with a, a rather slow sound when the hammer whomps into the string, right? And then it grows, almost like a, a singer singing a big vowel, right, without a consonant, is what the piano does. This starts with a consonant and drops into a vowel. Okay, so it's a in the language model, it's quite it's quite different. Um, so you know it, this kind of music, um, in, it often requires you know rather fleet tempos and that kind of thing. So, and I hope you can hear it makes it makes sense. It's really fun to play. So far as we know, Scarlatti wrote everything at the harpsichord. Uh, he was, you know, this is site-specific music uh, created to light up uh, this type of instrument where you have strings, you know, uh, being plucked in a wooden box. Just the way Chopin is, wrote everything at the piano, and Chopin's music is designed to light up a wooden box with thicker wires and hammers in it, you know. And, and all of his expressive devices are based upon that. Scarlatti's on the harpsichord, and I would argue Chopin's on the piano. Uh, and they don't translate very well into other mediums. I mean, you can do it. You can play Chopin for orchestra if you want, but it always sounds so lame, I think, you know? I mean, compared to what it does on the piano. Um, so anyway, they, and, and I think Scarlatti is really a, a wonderful, wonderful harpsichord composer. It always feels good to play it. Any questions about him before we go on to Johann Sebastian Bach? Yeah. Scarlatti never knew Mozart, so far as we know. Yeah. Oh, but it com by comparing him to Mozart? Ah, right. That's a, it was a, uh, James Gaines says, the best way to break up a dinner party is to claim box superiority to Mozart. I always, say, I always think that's pretty good. You know, and so she wants to compare Scarlatti and Mozart. Um, I mean, they both have, a, you know, Mozart has a lot of Italianate influence in his music. Uh, this kind of ability to write these great tunes and sunny melodies. Um, and you could hear it right there that that has a Mozartian type of elegance and line to it. Um, but I, I don't think that they're, in the great scheme of things, I don't think that they're that similar a person, you know. I think theatrically, Mozart really studied Handel quite well. Uh, and Mozart, was in, as a dramatist, was interested in what you can do to shape the evening so that when the moment comes, you can take the roof off, you know, which is what Handel does. You'll notice Bach, Bach really kind of avoids taking the roof off. I mean, he's a real Lutheran. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, I mean, Bach, no, it's, no, it's true. I think Bach was says, you know, if you're having that good a time, you shouldn't look at it a little more carefully, you know? So it's like, it's just, <laughs> so, so, but Mozart, Mozart and Handel are interested in that kind of ecstatic theatrical moment. So it's, it would take us another, uh, you know, Mozart v. Scarlatti would be another huge thing. Um, but thank you for asking. And there was one more question. Yeah, and then, uh -huh. You Go. mentioned Handel. Wait, uh, Peter Schifferly says that Scarlatti got so fat at the end of his career that hand crossing. That he couldn't care. Career. And you know, the Scarlatti overweight myth is that's supposed to be not true. That's uh, according to the latest research, you know. There, you know, so whereas Handel's is pretty well documented. Um, but of course, Scarlatti, we hardly, we don't have, you know, many pictures of him. Nobody wrote about him. You know, he's really off the radar, you know, um, the public radar, right? Um, so, yeah, the story was that, that Scarlatti got so fat that he couldn't do the hand crossing, you know. So, it's a nice story. Yeah. It's a nice, it's like, who knows, right? So, let's look at the Johann Sebastian Bach. And uh, so, Bach, again, born 1685 into a long line of of church musicians and city musicians, the Stadtpfeiffer, but they were professional musicians many generations back. 
and probably about four or five generations back before Bach that they, his ancestors would have come out of Hungary, the area we now call Hungary and Austria, uh, which has always been a hotbed of music in, in the West. Probably it is our, you know, Tigris and Euphrates for, for musical thought in, in Europe. Anyway, so Bach, but Bach lives in central Germany. He is part of, the, of a Lutheran. Uh, you know, a huge part of Germany is Lutheran by the time Bach is born in 1685. Had he been born two generations earlier, he would have been probably like his grandfather out there on the battlefields in the Thirty Years' War, which is like the Civil War, our Civil War, except it went on for 30 years. It was just horrific. Right? Had Bach been born in that period, we probably wouldn't have his music. But things had finally settled down in the late 17th century, and you had a period where people could concentrate on, on the religion as, as it had been portioned out between Catholic and Protestant areas, and there wasn't fighting. One of the most important things about Bach being a Lutheran is that Martin Luther insisted that music be in every part of the service and that music, I mean, Luther loved music, and he also insisted that the German language be used in the church service, um, and which was, of course, a, a great heretical act as far as the Catholic Church was concerned, um, but the Protestant churches pushed it through. So here you have, uh, I mean, and it's hard to imagine in Germany how all these little towns, right? Every town with more than 25 people has a church. And that church has a musician, right? And that who was supposed to be writing music, right? You could borrow other pieces if you wanted to, but it would really behoove you to write stuff that's fresh that people had not heard before. So there, the, all these thousands of music masters are creating music on a weekly basis, okay? Uh, and a lot of it wasn't particularly good. It doesn't, you know, right? But they, their relationship to music was like what we do with vid what we do with video. We just make videos of everything, you know, like that, right? And they made, they made music with everything, and they believed that music was all was was tied to your spiritual life. It could express it, and and nobody took this more seriously than Johann Sebastian Bach. He just happens to be one of the greatest musicians, greatest thinkers, and uh, artists we've ever had. You could argue. There's, you know, one Da Vinci and one Bach and one Shakespeare, you know. I mean, it's, it, he had a mind like that. So there he is in his Lutheran church writing a cantata a week for years and years, you know. If, and, but with Bach, he's never on automatic pilot. He actually reinvents himself every week. Nobody knows how he did this. But, but every cantata was somehow cut from a fresh piece of, of spiritual, intellectual material. I think I, you could argue that Bach is really a summation of the, the ideals that have been put forth in the Renaissance to begin with, which is that the spirit and the intellect could be woven into one thing. I mean, Shakespeare is an alchemy of, of sound and meaning all right, and rhythm and, and, and paragraph structure and all of that so that the artistry and the spirituality of it are all, are all one thing, indivisible. Um, so we're going to do a prelude and fugue by Bach here. This is from the Well-Tempered Clavier. He wrote this when he was about 35 years old. It was completely uncommissioned. He wrote it for his students. It's preludes and fugues in all keys. Right. Um, and we'll talk about why he did that. In, in Bach's, the, the Well-Tempered Clavier is devoted to a tuning. It actually has the tuning in the title. And it was a new tuning. It's the way I have this harpsichord tune here. C major was the home key. So you so that's why he starts in C. And it was the sweetest of all keys. And you as a musician, you tuned your instrument so that C was sweet.
So the, the poet, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. It's cool. You notice how high the beginning starts on the harpsichord. It seems really high, and then by the time you get to the end, it seems very low, right? There's a huge change into the chest voice. Um, the poet Goethe, who comes many generations after Bach, said that that prelude for him was the stillness in the breast of God before creating the world, which is nice. And for Bach, who was a truly religious spiritual man, maybe Bach would have probably said that piece was Wednesday, you know? I was like, <laughs> that's the irony of it, right? So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just the way it goes. You can either write it or you can't, right? So, you know, but you notice, I mean, it's such an amazing piece because he repeats everything he does. Right. Uh, here's a man who wasted not more than 10 minutes of his life, and what's he doing? Dallying. <laughs> I know, but it's not dallying, right? If you take out the repetition, then the meaning of the piece is revealed. So, so I'm going to now edit it, and I'm going to pull out the repetition. Here's what's left. It's just cute. Isn't that interesting? Now here's the way he wrote it. Notice the repetition. The repetitions, your blood, I think you could measure it, your blood pressure actually drops in the repetition, right? So it's a sense of grace, is that you're being given, something is given to you. You don't have to work for everything, right? There is something that is free. Right, and this, this is an example of it. And the repetitions kind of catch that and allow you to access the, the wonderful part of your life and every good dog you had or whatever. You know, I mean, but you notice, I mean, in those repetitions, it all, the sense of memory comes, it is, is in there, right, and all the good things. Um, it's incredible that he, only Bach knows when to waste time, you know, like, or whatever it is. Not, well, not waste time, but just relax and spread out. So that's the C major prelude. Um, when he goes to a key like C sharp minor in the new tuning called Well Temperament, you gotta really mean it, because this is one snarky key. So, so. So C sharp minor had this transcendental quality. That's like the 11th hour kind of a moment, you know, or a Gethsemane scene. It's, there's just something that it's right at the edge of things. If you go, if just before I play the piece, if you go back to C minor, this is, C minor is about like property taxes, right? <laughs> this is, you, see, you hear C minor has this unbelievable gravitas and it's like, it's, it's due at 11.59 tonight. <laughs> You better hit send, you know. So, but in Bach's world, in the well-tempered world in which all the notes are tuned in slightly unequal half steps, right, every key had its own acoustic stamp, okay? C minor was different from C sharp minor, different from D minor, different from E flat minor, which is important because we grew up in an era where all those little differences had been erased by the piano tuners in favor of a completely uh, utilitarian system called equal temperament in which all things had the same acoustic stamp. All keys did. So here, here you have this great variety and he wrote, he wrote 24 preludes and fugues in every key to show this amazing expressive device that he had at his hands. And then when he was in his late 40s, he did it again. You know, he'd run another complete set of preludes and fugues. That's the second half of this book. The busy bee that he was. <laughs> so, here, so here's C sharp minor prelude and fugue from the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier.
Thank you. Thank you. That style is called a lute style. And I still have this note that is misbehaving. I'm so sorry. This is like it happens on the road. We should have group therapy here. It's like, so of course, well, you know, what happens is that the note that you're trying to play over and over again is suddenly not there. We'll see if it'll stay for a bit. Okay. Wanted to play you at least a little bit of this fugue. This is a fugue in five voices. So you'll hear five voices pile in, and then once they're all running, Bach will introduce a sixth element. And you'll hear it. It's a, suddenly it'll start raining. Okay. <laughs> so forth. Anyway, you get the idea. It's a very long piece, but you get the, you get the idea that, I mean, there's just no prisoners in a piece like this, right? Yeah, we got two, three, two or three minutes, but you get the idea in this piece that there's really, there's just no going back in it. Um, and it's, it's hard to imagine that, that Bach would write a piece on a theme like this. You know, that's his melody. Remember Bach's own name is... In German, B is B flat, then there's A, C, and then H is B natural. And at the end of Bach's life, he writes a fugue on his own name. So look how similar it is to what we just did. Or. This is interesting. When you listen to this, like, you know, realize that the 20th century is not very far away, right? Doesn't that sound like some of the creepiest movie music you ever heard? You know, it's like. <laughs> My gosh, you know, so, so isn't it interesting that, 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 that incredible sense of, of, of a barren landscape, right, uh, is, is already working its way into this music. So we only got a couple minutes left. I'll take a few questions um, and, uh, you know, talk about you know, Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, and, and the Baroque period, what, whatever suits your fancy. Yeah, yeah. Here comes the mic. Yes. The crow feather. The crow feather, yeah. What about it? Feather piece. Uh, how often do you have to change that? Um, so in a week where I'm practicing a lot, he says, how, long do you ha how often do you have to change a crow feather? Um, in a week where I'm practicing a lot, probably I'll have to take an hour to uh, fix quills, cut new ones, shape ones that have gotten, you know, are misbehaving, things like that, like this guy right here. So, you know, that kind of thing. So 
it's, it's, and I also, in a week of practice, I probably have to tune it four or five times, the instrument. But you can, I can tune this in less than 10 minutes. So yeah, is so. the quill like two inches long? Two, and the quill is three millimeters long. You can't see it from there, yeah. You can't, yeah, you can't. She says, how can you even see it? And the answer is, you can't, right. I, you know, it, it, it's the, it, this, the sound of this instrument, think about it in terms of art, is like this single hair brush that they, they painted with for centuries. I mean, all Leonardo's work is done with a single hair brush, right? That's why in the Mona Lisa and the Giverna da Benci, you cannot see the brush strokes in her forehead because it's so, so woven, right? So does that make sense? It just comes from a different sensibility. Um, and and it's, so, yeah, you, but you can, you can see it if you come up here and, and look later, okay. Yeah, it does exist, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Are the keys different or similar from a piano? The, so there, that's a great question. There are, he said, are the keys similar or different? There are, this is a four octave instrument. All of the well-tempered clavier fits in these four octaves here. And, uh, but, and so there, middle C's in the middle. The octave is actually slightly bigger than a piano's octave. Often harpsichords, the octave is smaller. The keys are a little smaller. These are shorter front to back, but similar, you know. I mean, the repertoire I'm playing for you here, I just never play on the piano. So I'm, I, I know it in this language. Does that make sense, you know? Yeah. You know, in the, uh, so, yeah, other questions? Yeah, those are good. Nothing about Bach handles. <laughs> Yes? No other questions about who the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you trained on piano and how difficult was it to make a transition? Yeah, so I played everything on the modern piano and through a master's degree uh, down at Champaign-Urbana. And then I heard a guy play Mozart on a forte piano and I was really, I, I was excited that Mozart, the humor in Mozart's music came out on the forte piano in a way that I could, the modern piano could never do it. It just, the modern piano didn't have a sense of humor in that music. So that was, no, it just doesn't. I mean, and where's the forte piano? You can hear, and the forte piano is kind of like half harpsichord, half piano. It's in the middle. Um, I think I brought my forte piano when I was here 12 years ago. Yeah, or whatever it was, 15 years ago. So, um, uh, so, so that, no, and so it was just one step at a time. And then I, I, I went and did a doctorate in forte piano and, you know, and just, so, and I play piano, harpsichord, and forte piano all at the same. I do, what I do is tend to keep the repertoire separate. So my hands, they remember what language they're in. No, it's true. It's that, you know, I mean, I could do it on any of them, but it just, so, and I think the cross training, right now I'm doing a lot of work on an 1850s Bersendorfer piano, uh, doing a lot of Chopin and Brahms and all that. I swear that piano is so sensitive that it actually makes my harpsichord playing better, so. For whatever reason, is it, yeah. Other question or no? No other. So there's okay, somebody else gonna, that. Wait, oh, you wait, already wait. had one. Nobody. I'm gonna, else? I'm gonna pause. <laughs> yeah, I see. Oh, Christine. Okay. Christine. So I want to real quick. We have to head to sure. our break. Um, so if you have any more questions and you want to stay and ask him, sure, you can. So we, um, but can we give Trevor a oh, round of applause and thank him for being here? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are so kind. Thank you so much. For